So this topic this morning is all about funding and finance options. Um, this is something that I see come up time and time and time and time and time again. People are um, in a dilemma because they want to get funding because they want people on their courses because they know that they can help them. Um, and when they can't, they slash the prices of their courses because they feel that that is the only way that they can um, attract people into the industry. And un unfortunately, what it's doing, in my opinion, is that it's devaluing a lot of the training and education that's going on. And if you've seen the last couple of weeks that we've done, we've looked at um, options in qualifications and in particular, making sure that the information and guidance is there to support the learner, to make sure that the, the programme that you're delivering out is fit for purpose. And there are a number of different training programs that are available and it's it's about finding the right one to fit the learner so it's not about um saying that any particular way of training is um not valuable it's about finding the right one so the question about um uh funding um it can be actual funding real funding um, but it can also be in the form of grants uh, there are finance availables and also I want to just touch briefly on payment plans as a as a suggestion for you. So the idea is that you can look at the options and then look at, you know, what, what is applicable for you or what you think you might like to do. So hopefully it might give you some ideas as well. So it's it's a big subject and I apologise if I don't get anything absolutely right because I've not been involved with um, funding for a while for quite a while, which is why I've asked three people who actually are involved in funding at the moment to actually come on and give their um, uh, information and their experience. But this is just a, a very, very broad overview for you. Um, the acronyms for funding um, have changed. And certainly when I was last involved with funding, I had, uh, obviously I was involved with funding within further education, but then in my own private training, I started without any funding at all, but we grew and we actually got involved with a school and then one thing led to another and we ended up with both SFA and EFA funding. So that was basically 16 to 19 year olds and 19 plus. And those acronyms now have been brought together to create the ESFA, which is the um, Education and Skills Funding Agency. And they have a total, well, probably even more than now, um, 58 billion pounds worth of funding and education. So actually there's a lot of money and I'm sure it's actually gone up with the new traineeships. Um, the ESFA are also there to regulate the funding and education sector from the finance side of it. So they look at the, the issues around fraud um, and they make sure that the, um, the people involved in giving out um, funds and giving out education and receiving funds are non-fraudulent. And they make changes based on, on that situation. And there was a big change made in 2016 because of a lot of fraud. Um, so their, their bag is about um, delivering to made big major projects um, to key services of the education and skills sector. They run across national career services, apprenticeship services, and their learning record services. So that's what they're all about. So the ESFA have three main um, types of um, programs that they fund for. The top one being apprenticeships, then we have the advanced learner loans, and then we have the adult education budget. And I don't know which one has been um, given more money to or um, money taken away from, but I think the adult education budget has been affected mostly. So I don't just give out money to um, anyone, obviously. I think you probably realize that. You can't just ruck up and say, hey, I, um, I run a training organization, please um, give me some money so that I can carry on working and carry on earning a living. The whole point of you being an approved training provider is that you have something to offer. You have something that the ESFA want to be able to give their money to. So that's really important when you're thinking about your delivery program. So funding is applied via a tendering process. So it's not an easy process as, as our guests will tell you about. And in order to 
um, be on that tender process, you actually have to be on their approved list. So organisations that want to deliver um, uh, through the register, first of all, they have to be on the UK Register of Learning Providers and you have to have a UK provider reference number. Now, I've seen this quite a lot on um, some training organisations websites and people have said to me that they have got a UK registered learning providers number, therefore they must be an approved learner to approve loans. It's not the case. You can get a learning provider's number, anybody can get that, it's not too difficult to prove, but what it does do is it allows you then to become um, a member of the register of training organizations and this is uh, this is known as ROTO. Um, sadly ROTO has been closed since 2016 and that was when I made a decision to pull out of funding because the the government changed their their rules on the whole contracting process and I just decided that the training provider that I was working with, or rather the primary training provider I was working with, really hadn't got a good grip of what was going on. And I just was fed up with being mucked around. We also had a particularly awful group of students that year and a particularly awful um, set of parents to deal with. Um, and I think that's sometimes um, something that you don't always think about is all the, the negative that, that comes with the, the golden goose, if you like. So if you are on Roto, you do have a subcontract or a funding partner, uh, or you are a funding partner, then you can subcontract up to £100,000 a year. And a lot of people think that that's very exciting. So advanced learner loans are, was the sort of the, the most recent exciting thing to come into our sphere, because the majority of people that we want to work with I think in our industry are 19 plus. They are people that are looking for a change of career um, and they are wanting to take this um, student loans that they may have taken to go to university, but at the time university wasn't an option for them. So they maybe went off and did something else. They've got some life experience and they're now wanting to change a career. That's what the advanced learner loans were for. So they start at level three because level three is an A level um, level and they go up, up to a degree level. Um, I think I'm right in saying that a master's is not actually covered. So a master's is level seven or eight, and that's actually not covered by the student loans company. And you can, I think, and I might be wrong in this, have three student loans in your lifetime. So that's that's a lot of um, that's a lot of uh, funding. It does sit as a um, a debt, so it's it's your debt. It's something that you have to pay back, but it's not taken into consideration when you're looking for a mortgage or um, looking for a loan for something else. So that, that's quite a positive thing. So young people are very much encouraged to apply for a student loan. The, the positive thing about student loans is that the money is paid directly to the training provider. So you get your money in increments. And I think um, Sarah will tell us a little bit more about this later on. Um, so you don't get it all up front. Um, and the learner can actually put their, their learning on loan, on, on loan, on pause, so suddenly it could stop. And also, um, uh, if they pull out completely, then the funding stops as well. So there are some issues around that. So it's not a, a golden goose that means that you're going to get loads and loads of money. Um, so the adult education budget, which is... Um, I guess the, the, the pot of money that was very, very lucrative, um, probably around 10 years ago, there was a lot of money in the adult education budget, about the same time as the um, regulatory framework kicked in with the unitization. So there was a lot of funding that was going out for uh, sort of part courses, short courses, a lot for um, the training of the unemployed and statutory, statutory in, entitlement, which is the first level two up to the age of 19 and the first level three up to the age of 24, plus English and maths. So there was a lot of money in further education for basically anybody. Where whatever your circumstances were, there was a pot of money that you could you could claim. Um, and this is, I think, the start of the demise of uh, the, the funded um, provision link. Um, one of the things that then started to happen was that 
they started to remove qualifications from the list of funded qualifications. So if you are going to involve or you want to get involved with the adult education budget, you also do need to check that the qualification that you are wanting to deliver is actually on the funded list. So there's two things. It can sit on the um, uh, RQF, so the framework, as a qualification, which you can draw down and actually give approval for. But then if you want funding for that qualification and you want to draw down money from the AEB, it has to be on another list. And it used to be called LARA. Then it used to be called slara or something i'm sure somebody will put in the in the the, um, the comments what it is now because the the government really love to change the acronyms all over the place apprenticeships are by far the um the biggest push that the government um, has had for training um, and there are three different types of apprentices training providers that you can uh, get involved with um, one as a main provider and this is where the government the, the funding pot goes to you directly um, and but you have to be on the roto and the roto is now closed so if you're not on it then you can't be a main provider the employer provider, so this is where um, it, they're not a, um, a training provider, they don't deliver the training themselves. Um, sorry, the main provider is somebody who manages the contract, if you like, and there's a lot of paperwork around managing a contract. Um, the employer provider is um, a, a business that actually draws down the money directly, but also does all of the training. And then we have supporting providers, which is um, a sort of a, a two part relationship where you would be supporting either as the the off the job or on the job. So there, there's a number of different ways in which you can get involved, either as a training company or as an employer. But then not every person is suitable for an apprenticeship and as an employer you may not be ready to take on an apprentice you might feel that that person doesn't have the skills to be an apprentice because the new apprentices framework has changed quite a lot I think it's next week I've got a tutorial with um, a salon owner who's got four salons they are beauty um, down in the southwest and also um, uh, Rochelle who is the lead, um, the lead IPA I don't know how Donna has managed to get herself in the waiting room. <laughs> um, and so therefore the government came up with um, fairly recently um, a new um, programme, which is the traineeships. And traineeships is another way of supporting young people to get them into a position where they are then ready to um, apply for an apprenticeship. So that's another way in which you can get involved with um, working with young people and offering your services as a training provider. We then have the European Social Fund, the ESF. Now, I don't really know what's going to happen with the social fund, whether that will disappear or just reduce. I don't know. If somebody's on this call that can tell us, then that would be lovely. But the ESFA, um, sorry, the ESF is really there for, um, if I said vulnerability, so they, they fund projects which are all around um, people that are at risk. Um, so they work through the Department of Work and Pensions um, for, um, has the overall responsibility, but then they also work through the Education and Skills Fund um, uh, funding agency. So they might actually um, put together a specific project, but also the National Offenders Management Service. So there's a lot of work that is done in prisons as well for um, helping people get back into education and training. So there's some areas there. And I think some of the people that are on the call today have had experience working with those groups of people as well. So it'd be great to hear from, from those people. So as a subcontractor, as a partnership, I've asked um, Sarah Tipple, Gail, who isn't Clark or could be Clark, and Paula Bamford to, to come and, and talk to us. So if I just stop my screen share for a moment. And I wonder, Sarah, would you mind unmuting yourself and waving at everybody so everybody can see where you are because we've actually got two screens going at the moment, which is fantastic. Um, but if you want to see Sarah's lovely face, then you can click the view and put speaker view and then you'll be able to, to see her when she speaks. But Sarah, you've been involved with funding for quite a while, I think. Would you like to just introduce yourself and, um, and tell everybody a little bit about your experiences with funding? Yes, no problem. Um, morning, everybody. So my name's Sarah Tipple. Um, 
I have an independent um, training company and over the last few years we've worked with a couple of different um, partners mainly specialising with the advanced learner loan provision. Um, we're just touching on apprenticeships and traineeships at the moment um, to try and offer some different funding streams to our learners. We also have accreditation as a centre um, with VTCT. So the reason that um, Louise has asked me to come and have a little chat to you all is mainly because of the amount of work um, that has to go into the partnerships. And I think we see a lot, we discuss a lot, um, where people are asking where funding comes from, how they can get here. It is available if you can dig deep enough. Um, but really it's just to kind of give you a bit of an insight into the level of input that's required for that to happen. Um, in our organisation, we have, at the moment, I'm going to say eight team members. Um, some of those are tutors only, some cover some admin and management as well. For us to be able to run a fairly small loans provision, we have four of us working on the administration and management side. One of those specialise in enrolments. Um, so our enrolment procedure for a loan funded learner is actually a five step process, which is great for allowing um, us to determine whether or not learners are on the correct program, making sure that they're dedicated and that they've got the skills needed to carry on. But it does also mean that we put a lot of time and money into some learners that don't actually then enrol or they don't continue with their program. At the moment, I would say most of those people are opting for the shorter um, accredited courses. So it's seen by many that this is a cheap or free option for them to actually carry out their training when they then go through, jump through the hoops that they need. It can be a very different process. Um, we have currently about, I would say, 30% of our learners are on a learning break because of the situation, which at the moment is completely understandable. However, it means that the payments to us stop. Mm. We're with, at the moment, we're with a particularly good, responsible funding partner. Um, everything that we do has to come under their umbrella. We don't get um, any any say really in what in how the programs are run it is all standardized we completely operate as a satellite center um, with a partnership so it's not a subcontract which means obviously if the money from the ESFA stops to our partner it stops to us so we still have bills we still have tutors we're still trying to support those learners, even though they may not be generating any income because they're not technically engaging with their learning. So some months, the wages bill is higher than what we're pulling in from yeah. the funded programmes. Yeah. Um, and it's just not a... Um, it's not all rainbows and unicorns, unfortunately. Um, and as I say, at the moment, we are with a particularly good partner, I would say, out of the few partners that we've had and out of the centres that I go into as an IQA or as an EQA um, with VTCT, we see huge variations in that. Um, and we've kind of stuck with our partner and we do try it to make sure that we're always part of their standardization, that we're following everything, the delivery plans, the, the administration and the reporting is all done by the main hub. So when you put that into context, as a small independent uh, training provider, we have four administration staff, that's on top of the, the training partner, so the prime contract holders, many managers, an administration team that they have to have in place to be able to hold that contract. So it's quite a big affair 
to try and get this put in place, to maintain it, to be on top of your reporting, to be on top of the learner engagement, um, progress that needs to be shown to be able to pull down that funding. It's, it's quite uh, tricky, let's say. When you get into it, you're not really aware of how much is involved. Mm -hmm. That being said, I'm not here to discourage anybody from trying to find those links. It would be a case of be willing and open to learn what you need to learn. And if you're looking at a partner that is kind of saying, no, 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 it's fine. You can just enrol the learners and do what you need to do with them and we'll pay you X amount. As lucrative as that seems, really consider whether or not the contract that's in place is going to be viable long term because it is a huge investment, a time investment, and there's a lot to learn um, and a lot to kind of put out up front to be able to maintain these contracts. And if you're with a provider that could potentially lose that because their standardisation isn't in place, they're running it as a subcontract as opposed to a partnership, then you could potentially find that you're at a loss when they've funding maybe gets clawed back or their contracts don't get renewed, Ofsted come in and they don't meet the requirements and so on. Um, sorry, Can I pick up on that? Yes, when you, what you just said about Ofsted. So this is something that um, anybody who's been in further education, it kind of, the word Ofsted kind of fills you with fear and dread um, because it's not a nice process to go through. And I can, I'm so excited, because, not excited. I managed to get through 12 years of further education and missed every single Ofsted because either it was just before I joined or I was on maternity leave or I just left. So it's just like, whoa. So tell me about Ofsted because for, for those people that don't know Ofsted's role, they are very much the, uh, the, the partners of ESFA, aren't they? they? They look after the standards of the actual teaching um, and you, you have to jump through a number of hoops there as well. Um, put your hands up that those people that have actually been involved in a, uh, an Ofsted um, funding, either the, or really or um, with your little reactions, stick, a, stick a, a, a thumbs up or a clap or a crying face, just so I can see how many people, because it comes up against your names. Yeah, yeah, lots. <laughs> so, um, Sarah, tell us a little bit about Ofsted, can you? Yes. So, Ofsted um, are the inspectors. They will come round periodically. If you have any partnerships um, or if you draw down any public funds directly for education, you will be subject at some point to an Ofsted inspection. Um, I believe now they operate with two days notice. So that's all your centre gets for you to be able to get prepared. The idea for this is obviously so that we don't have what I believe used to happen previously, um, where a centre has a little bit of notice and then everything's in place. Everybody's in, you know, correct and present with their paperwork when the inspectors come. It gives you enough notice that you can get what you need available and you can pull the resources that you need um, to be able to to take on this inspection but not enough time for you to be able to create all of the missing gaps and fill those gaps to to make it appear better than it is um, so Ofsted will come along they do observations on your teachers they do what's called deep dives. So they'll look into the quality, into the administration. They will audit your data and make sure that what's being returned is accurate and correct. Um, they'll look at any external partnerships that you've got, any providers. So anybody, whether or not it's being um, run to standard, if you was a partner for any of the funding streams, and the main provider gets an Ofsted inspection, they could and probably will turn up at your place of work and want to carry out that inspection as well. Um, it goes into the management systems. It looks at every aspect of that business that uses public funds. They'll look at the support that you're offering to learners. They'll look at whether or not, um, and this is one of the main 
things that, that we've been looking at in our own um, area at the moment. They'll look at whether or not you're enrolling learners on the correct programme. So for example, we have a partnership for advanced learner loans, but there could be learners that turn up that are only just 19. That actually, a traineeship or an apprenticeship would suit better, and we have a responsibility to refer them on for a different type of programme. And Ofsted will check to make sure that those referrals are being done appropriately. So we're not just getting bums on seats. Mm. And they will also look at it from the other aspect of um, whether or not a learner is aware of what the outcomes of that qualification is and what plans they've got to actually use that qualification to be able to bring them employment or an income. And if you've got people that are being withdrawn at late notice in their qualification, why is this? Because they want to make sure that we're not drawing down 80% of the public funds for that qualification mm. for a learner that we know isn't able to complete and then kicking them off at the end and saying, well, you know, we basically budgeted for them to complete that. Mm. We've got that money and they've used up one of their loans. Mm. So it's there really to, to safeguard the public funds and make sure that they're being used appropriately. They're also looking for value added. So they want every centre to be able to show where you're giving over and above the um, criteria, what additional support are the learners getting, what opportunities do the learners get from you as a centre, as opposed to if they were to go to the centre in the next town that have also got access to this. But of course, as an independent training provider and as a partner, we have we have to make this work. We have to find what is that value added. Um, many places will say, well, do you know what? We'll give them a kit. Um, so that's extra, something that we don't need to do. But Ofsted will like that. Mm. You know, we're looking more along the lines now of offering additional training to people that complete their course on time to, that complete to a higher standard as the carrot for the value added. But all of that obviously comes out of our budget. That mm. comes out of our time. We're paying the tutors to do that. We're having the admin cost of setting that up. We have to pay for the additional approvals as our own centre to be able to add on to those. So it's a big, it's a big old task to be a small provider with small numbers and be able to perform in line with those larger centres um, and to, to even know and understand what it is that people are going to be looking for when they turn up to do these audits. Mm -hmm. You know, I was saying to somebody yesterday, actually, we could be mid-audit and not know mm -hmm. for certain elements, for data and stuff like that. And we wouldn't know. And if we suddenly got a call from our partner saying, OK, we're mid-audit, where is this? What happened here? What's that form? No matter what we're doing, we have to drop that and make sure that everything is there. So we're always trying to find ways to be proactive and be ahead of the game and prevent data loss, anomalies and stuff like that. That's quite a big task when, you know, a few years ago I was running a salon. <laughs> And nobody, you, you don't know what you don't know. And until you're involved in it, until you see it, and until you're part of it, you don't necessarily understand that this is what's going to happen. And when you get that phone call to say we're mid-audit, that actually, you know, if you're a small team, then you're, you're the person, you are responsible for dropping everything that you're doing and making sure that that happens to safeguard your own business, your tutors, income, you know, your learners, courses. Mm. So it's a lot. It can be very profitable if, you know, if you're able to get a prime contract and you hold that contract and you can run it very well. However, I don't believe it's as profitable as what people believe. I think you have to be interested in the outcome of the learners you need to be excited for the learners new careers to be able to justify the amount of work yeah. that goes into it
That's really interesting, Sarah. And I think actually it comes back to everything that we've been saying over these tutorials, that the information and guidance that you give that, that young person, the old person, the middle, whatever it is, is so important to start with. And I see a lot of people that you, you mentioned about going, you know, running a salon and then going into training and then having funding. Um, but also um, that comes back to anybody who is not involved with funding and who is running their own training academy. If you're going from running a salon as a therapist into creating a training academy, there are things you need to learn. There's, you need to learn about the business, but you need to learn about quality assurance, about training. Education and training is not just um, turning up and showing somebody how to do something and then off they go. It's much, much more to it than that. And it's easier, I think, if you've been in an FE organisation, you've been involved in funding and Ofsted and systems and procedures to be able to then use all of that kind of coming back to run your own organisation sort of effectively. And I think this is this is actually one of um, one of the corners of my triangle is actually looking at um, um, educators and training organisations, what actually do they need to do and what skills do they need to run? And this is something that uh, Donna does very well to help them. Gail, you were nodding furiously through most of that, weren't you, as Sarah was saying. You have, um, thank you, Sarah. Um, Gail, you have a slightly different experience, don't you, um, as far as the type of learners that you work with and the type of funding that you, you draw down. Would you, would you like to introduce yourself and explain what you do? Okay, yep, no problem. Um, I ask you just, that's it, tip your, tip your, so we can Yeah, see. I try not to do full face, facial views. This is the first time I've worn makeup in about three weeks, so it was a bit of a task this morning trying to get it right, so I do apologise <laughs> up front. <laughs> you look lovely. <laughs> oh, thank you. Right, I started sort of um, delivering when I was about 21 for a local training academy. I've done my D units, so I'm very old fashioned. I've got my 32, 33, 34. Um, I then bought a hair salon because um, primarily my background is hair. I am beauty qualified, but you really wouldn't want me doing anything on you, believe me. Um, so I run my salon. I had that, well, I've had that now coming up 17, just over 17 years, sorry. And 2016, I was approached by my old boss from when I used to teach to say, look, how would you like to start up a training academy alongside me? Um, She'd been doing it previously. This was for learners specifically from the care sector. So those were the ones that we targeted first and we did what was called the AQA unit award scheme. So um, very short, sharp, mini um, units, nothing obviously compared to an MVQ unit or an MVQ qualification, but for motivation for these type of learners, it was fantastic. So we did that um, and I did that for two years and I thought this is great, but what are the learners getting out of it? Moving forward from, a from going on to a college point of view or training provider point of view, um, it wasn't enough really to assist them into the next step of that environment. So we registered with VTCT, um, obviously delivering hairdressing, duty therapy, and also um, deliver all the teaching quals, et cetera. Um, and then again, brain starts thinking and sort of similar to what Sarah said, you know, if you think you're gonna make vast amounts of money in a short amount of time, it's never gonna happen. I've just had my mum on the phone going, where are you? What are you doing? I'm, I'm on a meeting and I'm literally like this, hanging out of the so you can't see me. She's like, don't you ever stop? And I think in our trade, if you own your own academy, I don't think you do ever stop. I think, you know, you could easily work for well, 36 hours a day if they were, you know, 36 hours in the day. But obviously, as I say, we registered with VTCT. So my next thing was, we need to get funding. I need this to grow alongside, obviously, the hair and beauty salon that we had. Um, I actually made contact and I worked for 12 months um, in partnership with somebody based down south. Now I'm in the Midlands, West Midlands, West Shropshire. I was traveling to Somerset, which wasn't a weekly occurrence, obviously, but even when it's every couple of months, it was a night over, it was two nights over, I've got a family, it was trying to sort of juggle everything. So we managed to find another provider who was happy to work in a partnership with us based locally. They don't deliver hair and beauty, so for them it was a winner winner. There was no competition, anything like that. Immediately, once we signed up with them, we had access to AEB funding, apprenticeships, um, traineeships, and also the SF funding, um, like obviously we've spoken about, which was specifically for 
learners who were they were self-employed or they worked in a salon and it was to upgrade give them some other kind of skills um, we also um, own a short course academy as well as the MBQ side so we've got two different academies going on so we're able to offer regulated and non-regulated um, education so um, again like Sarah was saying you've got to work the figures correctly with your um, partner um, obviously they'll want a percentage for their management fees etc cetera, etc cetera, and then you get whatever they don't want really um, we're very lucky in the way of um, they come and do all the sign up paperwork with the learners they do the initials they do the diagnostics they do the reviews so obviously they will probably take a bigger percentage than another provider or partnership should I say that we're doing all that but guess what I don't have that headache my staff don't have that headache. We haven't got to think, oh, this, you know, the, oh, the review's due, or well, we haven't done this, we haven't got that. That is totally their responsibility. Yes, sometimes I have to arrange the dates, but that can take me 10 minutes to arrange a date. It's not, you know, horrific. Um, we sort of run at a staff of about, I think there's about 10 of us all together now. Um, so again, which is a mixture of admin staff, liaison officer, um, and tutors because we've actually got two centres we've got one based in Shrewsbury and we've got one based in Oswestry so obviously we've got staff that work between the two and we're actually looking there could be by the end of this year another two if not three centres within our local area just we are very lucky we've got good backers so we've got as I say that local academy for AB funding which as we know is changing um, it's going to be for up to level threes. Now, I've looked, and please correct me if I'm wrong, and I would hope and pray that you are wrong. No, that I'm wrong, sorry, not you're wrong. Apologies. That uh, I am wrong. I can't see hair and beauty level threes on this new list that the AEB funding is going to cover. So they're in changing it. You're, you're absolutely right. They're not on there. Yeah, I was hoping you were going to tell me I was wrong. I don't like being wrong, but in that instance, I wouldn't have minded being wrong if it meant, obviously, for us, it was going to be a lot more beneficial in the long run. But obviously, it doesn't sound as though it no, is. Unfortunately, we haven't made it onto that list at all, so there will yeah. be no adult funding. So absolutely gutted, because for me, um, the provider that we're with for apprenticeships and that they do have adult, they do have access to the adult learning loans, advanced learner loans, but they don't. They don't like using them, so they won't allow me to tap into it. So once I finish with my level twos, where do they go? Because they don't stay with me, which is obviously what we want them to do for the next 12 months to complete their level three qualifications. So, yeah, absolutely gutted about that. But we also have another partnership in place with another provider where we have um, access to um, funding for NEAT or risk of NEAT learners. Thank you. Now... I can hold my hand on my heart and say, for us, it's brilliant. Um, I would say 80% of our learners are age 15 to 24, NEAT or risk of NEAT. Um, can you can clarify what NEAT stands for, because it's another one of these acronyms, wasn't it? Yeah, sorry, not in education, employment or training. So um, we, we deal with a lot of local schools. Obviously, our care sector, we still deliver to those and they love it because they don't have to pay privately. Schools love it because they haven't got to find money um, as soon as they hit the age of 50. My biggest gripe with it is that it's not for 14. It should be for years 10 and 11. That last two GCSE years get us onto the prospectus that they do for their choosing their options. But who am I to complain? Um, you know, I, I'm just a mere mortal at the end of the day. I don't work for the SFA or anything. Um, but obviously it can take it up to, um, as I say, the age of 24. Um, so, yeah, we have lots. There's You have to kind of work it right because obviously it's not, well, it is. It goes against Lars, um, the funding. So, again, a level two hairdressing, which we do do for some of ours. Level two, it's what, three, three, four, five, isn't it? Something like that for level two level hairdressing or beauty therapy. Again, because we're in partnership with somebody they will take their management fee but that's a lot more generous management fee than the other and you know it is really lucrative but you're getting 25 percent up front you're 70 i couldn't count then that's terrible isn't it i can't count up to 100 god knows how i run summer um you get obviously your other proportion your three quarters when it's finished so again you've got to prepare for in that meantime you're not in theory getting any money for them or because we've got the short courses 
because as long as they're aged over 16, we are then able to put them onto acrylic nails. We're able to put them onto lash lifting. Even though they're non-regulated, they are accredited by ABT, so they are insurable for them, so it's not a waste of time. But we're able to put little packages together to learning outcomes for guided learning hours, which we then can get them something in the meantime until we get that big balloon payment at the end. So we have, as I say, access to that, which is brilliant. If anybody's interested in that, um, the only thing that I could suggest would be getting in touch with your LEP to see who holds the contract in your area and obviously try and build up a partnership with them. Again, local get... enterprise, lo local enterprise yeah. um, partnerships. And if you just do a, um, I'll put it, when I do this um, um, video, I'll actually put it as the link notes to all of the various links. But yes, the local partnership um, is, is where you would need to go to. Yeah, and they obviously, again, the provider that, lead, that holds the contract for that, they don't do hair or beauty. So again, we're very lucky that they work with us and will continue working with us. And also through them, we've had a community grant. Now, again, I don't know if anybody's applied for them before, knows anything about them, but um, you put your tender in, what you want to deliver. And obviously at the moment, um, everything is coronavirus related, let's be honest. Um, so we just we've had one and we're just applying for another one and um our remit our specialism is um very generalized women women who have lost their jobs and need a new career that's going to fit around family life they're going to need a job in the long run that's not nine to five because of childcare, something they can do in the evenings when husband's at home so we are very much something that you know we can offer that and then with that funding you get 40 percent up front 40% after, well, sort of midway through your um, length of term, and that you get 20% when you complete. Um, it's not a profit making, obviously, exercise. It is a community grant. You have to prove that you spent all the money. If you don't, obviously, they're going to claw it back. But those are sort of the different funding routes that we have available to us. Um, I was going to touch on grants. Um... In, in the next slide, but I think it's, it's worth sort of bringing that in now. One of the things with grants, and there's almost a lot, there's a lot more flexibility with, with grants because there's like a pot of money and it could be used for this or it could be used for that. So that's definitely, I think, for a smaller training organization, a worthwhile um, exercise to go through. You have to think very carefully though about what are you, what are you offering? So it's not about I want to run a beauty therapy course. Now, where are all the people that I can fit on that? Your your tender process will not meet their requirements and it will just get thrown out. You have to look very specifically of the outcomes. So as Gail's was saying, um, you've got a very tight, a specific type of learner and you are creating a specific type of outcome for yeah. these learners. And if you do that, then you stand a much better chance. But um, the language that they use is very interesting. Um, I, I looked at a grant um, a little while ago and I actually decided not to continue with it because I couldn't understand what they were asking. And I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I've been in this game for a little while, but I just could not get my head around the language that they wanted. And it, it, maybe it was just our local LEP, I don't know. But um, so it's, it's worthwhile maybe paying a consultant to actually help you put a bid together um, and look at the outcomes that you want to give. And it also depends how, you know, because obviously we've built up a relationship with this provider. So I, like I did, I put my um, application in this, this time, as I say, it's gone in now, but I put it in in November. And yeah, like I said, maths ain't my strong point. I got, you know, they checked it all, they went all through and they were like, yeah, yeah, love it, but you can't add up, do it again. So they didn't put it through to obviously the panel because they checked it first. And they were good enough not to put it in to get it refused. They, you know, chucked it back at me and said, Gail, yeah, just have a look, you know, use your brain. You know, we've got that kind of relationship. You know, we've only worked with them for just over 12 months, but we've got that relationship. They respect what we do. And I, you know, to me, they're kind of gobs because they give me money. So, you know, whatever they want me to do, as long as I can jump through that hoop, you know, I will jump through that hoop because we want to build these, you know, partnerships for the next, you know, 20 odd years at the end of the day. It's not a here and now thing. It's a long term and any other funding streams they get. We can form again, very much like what Sarah said, you get an email, right? Learn a number because they all work in numbers. I do names, they do numbers and I know why they do it. But number, da, da, da. 
entry form. There isn't this box ticked. That hasn't done. You have an initial assessment. It doesn't say enough. It's blah, blah, blah. Putting their heads like this on a Monday morning or a Friday night when they send it through to you. But first thing Monday morning, you're on it. You do it. Because if you don't comply, are they going to carry on working? And it is, you know, it is a scary thing. You will do this stuff before they've asked for it. Do you know what I mean? You do it. I mean, like I was saying, we we have business admin, the same as Sarah and that. And now we go through, we double check it and triple check it before we put anything in. Because we want it to be right first time, not them throwing it back. Because they'll start thinking, do we want to work with them? There's always paperwork that comes back that's a problem. They've gone from working on the in two partnership, which is this one for NEETS. They've gone from having about eight partners, and I think we're going to be one of four that they want to continue working with because the other ones have just caused them too many headaches. Mm -hmm. They've had to claw back too much money, and they just said, we're not doing it anymore. So we want to stay fresh and stay you know, on their side, basically, to continue working with them in the future. But it is very much a case of they say jump and we say how high and, you know, the just paperwork's to, done what they want. So just to pick up on one of the questions that's come up in, in the chat um, with regard to uh, the ABT fund uh, courses being funded. Yes, they are, but as part of a project to help a specific type yeah. of learner. So it's not a case of I'm running ABT courses and I can get money for it. It's about you have a, a partnership relationship with a um, a primary fund holding agency that manage that fund and you work together to deliver outcomes for those people and part of that might be a traineeship part of it might be an apprenticeship part of it might be um, some short course provision which would get them to the next stage so it's all part part of the mix but you've got to be in that partnership before you can um, and do any of these yeah, none of the ABT courses have got a, is it a QUAN number? Is that the right No, that's right. You need a qualification so, number. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what we, so obviously none of the short courses have got that. It's only when, obviously, when you get with the big boys and that, that you've got that. Yeah. So, but what we do is put together like a mini course yeah. and it would have a Z number. So um, more of a guided learning hour course as opposed to obviously a QUAN course. So we still get funding for it. It, but it goes more on the guided learning hours as opposed to what that qualification name is yeah. but like i say because they are abt accredited it's not as if it's wasted because that learner will still get a recognized certificate even though it's for a short course but they can still get insurance so when they leave us if they're on the um neat program or even the community grant we do it on because you will get learners that can still go off they're doing their full mvq so again this might add a bit weight to what sarah was saying for you know value added is they would could potentially be on an ABT an AB funded course or a learner advanced loan course. Um, what else can we offer? So we have got short courses. So um, we could accredit with ABT. We could deliver these short courses. They're not registration fees with BTCT or City and Guilds. Obviously, yes, you still got your staff that you're paying for to deliver that course. But if you could mix them in with other learners in your area, private courses that they're funding it actually pays your tutor's wage then in theory if you've got let's say four people privately paying 200 pounds for a course and then you're putting in two others free then that course is still being paid for your tutor's wage is still being paid for by those privately funded learners so it isn't necessarily costing you anything really Fabulous. Gail, thank you so much for your input. That's a, that's a really good insight. Um, so you can see why um, the apprenticeship framework is really the one that the government is wanting to, to push because it's it's actually giving people real outcomes. And um, I think, as I said, I think it is next week that we will be having um, uh, our, our two people in to talk about apprenticeships because if you have got a training organization that is part and parcel of a salon which I know a lot of people have that actually might be a much better way forward for you to to look at apprenticeships um, but can I ask Paula now to unmute yourself and come in because Paula you work very differently Sarah and Gail you have quite sort of I would say mid mid-leveled organizations where you've got a team of people delivering this out but Paula am I right in saying that it, it's just you just you doing I, I don't have my own center anymore I did have a couple of people that were they were sort of self-employed so they would put in hours for me and I paid them by the hour to help me out in my own center and yeah. um, I, I related to what you said about the final year you had and mm -hmm. um, 
there's a lot of work exactly what the other two have just said is you you have to be prepared to please everybody and you need to have the great students to get you through that because you need to know that they're going to be getting their their new career and I don't I don't mean be thankful for it but you've been part of making their new career with them so when you get a student that sort of turned half of the class into problems really uh, troubled people and um, you you can't get the pleasure of the outcome for all the work that goes behind it and it, it's a big head play it and I think you reach a point where you think I need to step back now for my sanity because I'm, I'm ending up not really being me anymore um, so now I'm actually part of a team in Southend um, for a, for another company. So I still do all the recruiting for the courses, this, all the paperwork that's just for my cohort. Um, lots of paperwork that's additional as well, because being part of a team, you sort of got the same piece of paper that one month one person will want and the next month another person will want. So I still do all that admin but not half as much as what it was or anything like while I was listening to Sarah and, oh gosh, sorry. Gail. Gail, while I was listening to them, I was thinking, I don't know why you want me to talk really because they've covered everything and more. And I've switched off a lot as well. I don't, half of what they were saying, I was thinking, oh yeah, I remember that. Oh, is that what that is now? Because I, my, my mind has gone like, you know, like it does with childbirth, forget that bit. Because um, it's a lot, isn't it? it? It really is a lot. Maybe um, I can ask you some questions then, Paula. Yeah. So maybe start with um, why? Why did you look to seek funding? What was the kind of the? I, the... I was contacted. Um, it was before they couldn't subcontract out. So I was actually I was contacted by a centre in Devon. She wanted me to be part of her thing, but in my centre. Because so that you're, you're nails based, aren't you? Your your right? nails, your your nails, not hair or beauty. I I do other as well, but nails tends to be what I do everything on now. Um, apart from I have a salon, so I do all the services in my salon. But regarding teaching, I've done a little bit of massage, but not not a full course and not my own cohort. So yeah, nails is what everyone comes to me for. So yeah, I had. I had that funding, but then that was just before um, subcontracting couldn't be done. So I'd started a cohort, we were in week 10 out of 25, and I was told that I couldn't be with the girl in Devon anymore. But I'd got this commitment to these 16 students at the time and was just, I just didn't know what to do, what do you do? You know, you can't continue their education um because you can't go and pay for the course can you I'd been paid nothing either so you know you sort of, you've laid everything out the girls just talked about you've set up all the equipment you provide all the equipment and products that they use in class and you end up giving them some bits as well you know that you, they don't buy things and they've got to have practice stuff so I'd laid all that out and then the actual funding company that had been dealing with the girl in Devon came directly to me and said look you know, if you, we want to meet, we want to see if we can work with you. Um, so they actually then took me, I was direct with the funding. Um, and that was where I stayed. I stayed with them until oh, two years ago, I think now. Might be a bit less, probably about two years ago that I stopped with my own place. That must have been a very, very scary experience and, you know, very similar to the experience that, that I had um, in my last funded year, which, which made me decide that that was it. I, I, was, I was done with funding. Um, that, you know, if the, the place that is giving you the money goes under, that's it. You know, that, that's a very scary situation because what do you do? What do you do? Yeah, all I could think of, I was just thinking, because I have a private accreditation as well, I was thinking, right, well, I'm, I'm going to give these girls now, they've done like manicure and pedicure part, I thought I'll give them the private accreditation, yeah. obviously for free, and I've made the commitment to them, so I will train them in um, acrylic nails, pink and white, a bit advanced, but not all the art and everything, yeah. and that, that was what I, I thought, I'm just going to have to cut my costs, cut my losses, 
and train them for another six weeks or something and give them the private accreditation. Mm. But obviously I can't provide them with the MVQ. No, no. And they, they'd they gone for funded options because they didn't have the money to say, okay, we'll do it privately. So yeah. what do you do? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So just one last question, and thank you so much for, for that. That's really valuable. Um, what words of wisdom or words of advice would you have for anybody who's not part of a big team like Sarah or Gail that maybe doesn't want to to grow to that level just yet but wants to try and get into it slowly and to work as a partnership have you got any words of wisdom to how you can find a I group don't, I don't think you can know really I think you've got to have something at least at the scale that I, I don't know what Gail has but at least at the scale that Sarah's got yeah I don't think you can because they've changed all their regulations so much to how it used to be when you could just be a one person mm -hmm. and one person can't cope there there is too much even now as part of a team sometimes I think oh why am I doing this because there's still so much to do mm -hmm. so I, I think you've got you can't just think yeah the money's sitting there in a pot no no absolutely it's, it's yeah. not, and that pot has to be divided all the way down the line as well. So, yeah. you know, everybody's getting a wage, not, yeah. not a massive bonus. Yeah. Um, and they're certainly working for it. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for that. And thank you um, to Sarah Abel, who's put lots of really useful comments in the posts as well. Um, and Sarah runs a lot of apprenticeships. And if anybody's on Clubhouse, Sarah has a... Um, is it four o'clock on Monday, Sarah? Maybe you want to put that in there, in there that uh, she will be doing stuff. So you can go and, go and join her on, on Clubhouse. Okay, so let's go back to my, um, my next slide, which is all about, so, okay, so you, you can't get funding. I think maybe we've sort of... Um, realize that maybe we're, we're not going to be able to get funding um, unless we're already in. So what else? We talked about grants very, very briefly. Um, so your local enterprise agency, if you just do a search for local enterprise partnership, I think it is LEP, um, they will give you, and I think it comes up with a nice interactive map that you can have a little look and see who is the partner. You can then contact them and find out whether they have any grants available for specific projects. And in doing that, you might find a project that you think actually this could be something that I could be involved with and that would actually set the ball mold um, moving to, uh, to maybe put together a proposal for them. There are also charities. Now, I think there are very few charities that have a lot of money to spare, but again, if you can create an outcome, we have worked in the past with a charity called Gingerbread and Gingerbread support um, 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 abuse, women who have suffered abuse, getting their life back. So it's not just about doing a course and getting a qualification, it's about all the soft skills around, it's about the empowerment, it's about the mental health, it's about their um, ability to feel good about themselves and maybe some work experience. So if you can put together a program of development for somebody that they can come in, especially if you've got a salon environment, you can maybe look to, to help them work in a salon give them some uh, some skills that they can actually take out and actually some business structure behind that as well. And that was something that was very much in the heart of a job centre. When the job centre looked to fund courses, they want to make sure that you can help them um, get off the, the support, um, the income support or the, the, the numerous names that they give them, um, but basically off the, the, the state funding and be um, in their own workplace. So there are things around. And then lastly, you could look at selling in your training and development services into companies. Now, there are a lot of companies that give their employees benefits. And one of the benefits is that they do some kind of um, personal development. Now, Fords used to do it, and we used to work a lot with Fords. Um, uh, doctors do it in the final year of the doctor's placement they get a huge amount of money to go off and do something that's you know just in their own interests or they did don't know whether they still do um, and we, we taught um, a GP um, a massage 
that she could um, and uh, aromatherapy, which was really, really good. So there are um, pots of money that companies have. There's also, um, and it, it disappeared at the beginning of lockdown, but um, there was a building company, one of the biggest building contractors, they have a, um, a pot of money that they deliver business skills to. So that's something that maybe you might not be able to get funding or any money to teach facials, but you can work with a partner that's outside the funding um, remit to add on business skills, which means that you've got something much more valuable for your learner and therefore you are going to be much more uh, valuable to the learner and you're going to stand out from Dizzy Doris down the road that does a 50 pound course tomorrow um, because you're going to be able to give, and I'm sorry if there's a Doris on the call, um, there's a um, you're going to be able to give your uh, learner something much, much more valuable. And at the end of the day, we come back to the information and guidance. It's about what can you do for them? It's not about running a course and just finding hundreds of people to, to jump in. And then I do want to check, um, check in on finance. Um, you may already have seen these finance companies that uh, pay later, I think is probably the biggest one. Um, that's the one that um, I see around on all of the aesthetic sites. You see these four people that are delivering treatments, but they can also be used for people delivering training as well. So I spoke to James Bishop from um, Pay Later. I spoke to him about three years ago because I was interested in doing this for myself. And personally, I decided it wasn't for me and it wasn't something that I wanted to get involved with. You can't give finance to your students and have them pay you back um, with uh, an interest payment unless you are regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. So interest on loans through finance companies, whether that be a credit card or a um, bank loan or a personal finance loan, go from anywhere between one to 4%, which is between 12 and 48% APR. So your credit card is roughly 24% APR, so it sort of sits in the middle. They will do a soft credit check on your potential learners. And if the learner has either no credit rating or a bad credit rating score, they will give them the options of finance, but it will be anywhere up to 48%, which is you know, quite a lot of money really. Um, but for some people, it's the only way that they can afford. It's almost the, um, the payday loan situation, which, you know, there was a lot of problems with the amount of people getting in very serious debt. So it's something that you have to take very, very seriously. Um, but just to give you an example, if you had somebody that had a thousand pound loan over 12 months, it would actually cost the learner 83 pounds plus 40 pounds. So they would be paying 48, 480 pounds in interest on that 1000 pound loan every year. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I decided not to, to get involved because I felt it was just um, encouraging people to, to maybe get into debt that they couldn't afford it. Obviously the advantage is that you get your money in full and the loan company then do the um, chasing of any money that uh, they can't get back. There will be a setup fee um, and that depending on which level you go in on is anywhere roughly between about um, 900 pounds and it could be up to 1200 pounds depending on you know which category you join. There is also a um, monthly administration fee to manage the compliance because anybody who is offering finance has to send in reports on a monthly basis so unless you're able to do that reporting to the FSA then you need somebody to do it on your behalf. So there is a monthly admi um, admi administration fee. With the setup fee, they do a number of, of um, options now, mainly because they can supply you with all sorts of social, social media, the, the banners to go on your website. You have to make sure that you are complying with the FSA regulations with regard to making sure that people know what they're getting themselves into. There's sometimes finance calculators that you can embed on your computer on your uh, website as well. So it means that if a learner is looking to put in a loan, um, then they could put in the loan and work out how much that, that's going to cost them. Um, one of the advantages of doing this for your learners is that it helps build credit score. So, for instance, if you've got a huge program, let's just say a level three beauty therapy that you want to finance through this way, it would be advantageous for the learner to um, 
just take one small unit, apply for finance on a very small level. And as long as they pay it back, their credit score will go up, which means that next time they apply for credit for maybe the next um, unit, their credit score will be higher. Therefore, the loan option, the interest rate will be slightly lower. As long as they pay it back, their credit score will go up slightly. So to be fair, that is, a, I think, a very uh, responsible way of dealing with finance and something that actually you can help your your learner with um, incredibly. So building credit profile for younger people is um, is very important. Um, they quite often um, will then also charge you a percentage of that loan. So you've got the initial setup, which could be anywhere between 900 and 1200 pounds. That's a one off payment. You've then got a monthly fee of around about 60 pounds to be able to comply with the FSA. And then they make their money because if somebody um, takes out a loan for a thousand pounds, they will take um, a percentage of that. And it's roughly about 60%. So you're going to lose that 60, 60 pounds off your thousand pounds. However, it's something that is worth thinking about. And um, I'll put the link to James at Pay Later in the notes as well. Um, but there are lots of different finance companies out there. So that's another option for you. And then very um, lastly, the only other um, option I have for you is a payment plan. And this is what we do. So this is, it's not an interest. We don't add any interest on it to, at all, which we're not allowed to. We can legally, sorry, there should be apostrophe there. Um, that we can legally make a charge for processing, which becomes an administration fee. We don't, but you are allowed to. It's a risk. It's a big risk. And it's something that you need to make sure that you are um, you've got sufficient cash flow to be able to support this, because if you have everybody that signs up with you on a payment plan gets three quarters of the way through the course or even halfway or even even starts and then pulls out, you are potentially too far through the course to be able to bring somebody else in and that person is not going to be paying you any money. Yes, you can do credit checks and yes, you can ask for a guarantor. However, it's up to you to chase those payments. And if you've got good systems in place for, um, we, do, we do a payment plan, we ask them to pledge, we make it very, very clear it's not pay as you go basis. I say that repeatedly when I bring people on board that want to pay over a payment plan. Um, it's not a pay as you go, it's not you can stop now we use it to our advantage because what we do is we have a three month, a nine month and a 12 month option that doesn't necessarily match the program that they're on. So if they are on a year's program, they can still take advantage of the three, six or nine months payment plan. But what we do is we put more into that. So if somebody is doing a 12 month payment plan, they have to spend X amount of money with us to be able to get that option. But what it does is it brings their monthly payments down to a manageable level for them. And it also means they get extra benefits. So they get all sorts of extra things on top that actually are not really costing us very much money at all. Um, and in some cases not costing us anything at all, but it gives the learner added value. So this is what Sarah was saying with the, with the um, funding that you need to look for added value. Um, and those people that want to pay um, over three months, um, then they, they have less value. Well, they don't have less value, but they have less things in their basket, if you like. But it is up to you to make a claim against them if you want to. Um, having done that many, many times, I can tell you that it is a very emotionally harrowing process to have to chase people for money. And if you are like most therapists who start out in business, you don't like talking about money very much. Even to ask for money is a really big thing. So to chase for money is really hard. One tip I will give you, though, um, if you are sending emails to your students who you've got in your classroom and you're going to see tomorrow, you can create a little avatar. And this is what I started doing in the early days. Um, so I would create a different um, email address and I would uh, create a, an email footer. It wasn't a lie as such because, you know, it was still me. But I would say PP and I would say Pauline Chapman, um, 
finance administrator. So the email came from this avatar, which was Pauline. She did actually work for my company and I did ask her first. So it wasn't sort of like um, I was making this person up or lying, but it just, it wasn't me. So I was going back into the classroom and teaching the same person that the day before I had sent this letter saying, I'm very sorry, but you haven't made payment. And if you don't, we'll have to stop your training. And we will also be taking you through the small claims court. That learner would then not be embarrassed to come back into the class and the conversation would be offline. So that's just something that you could maybe think about, but there are lots of sort of tips like that, that you know, stop you having that um, emotional connection, uh, which becomes very, 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 very difficult. Um, there are also companies. So the, the other thing that you can do is to um, get in contact with, and we used um, a company called, I forgot what it's called, oh, DS Silverman. And they are basically a company that will chase, chase on your behalf. And they're quite relentless. They will, they'll email, they'll write, they'll um, phone, they'll text, they'll, they just are on the case the whole time. You've obviously got to have the right information that they give you, but that's another way around. And they also will then tell people that the next stage will be um, to take out a county court in judgment. And a CCJ is not something that most people want on their, um, uh, on their uh, credit score and I we have found also that we did go through that process um, we have had to and we ended up with a CCJ that does not mean you get your money just because that person's got a county court judgment against them um, what does happen though is when that person then goes to take out a mortgage it gets flagged up which is an awful situation to be in and I have um, I have had conversations with people that have rung me that have said, I didn't realize how serious this was. And, you know, it's really, really hard because, you know, on one end of it, you're saying, well, yes, I've had to pay. I've had to pay my staff. I've had to pay my admin. I've not taken a wage. Um, I've had to pay my all my uh, creditors. Um, and you didn't think it was important to pay me what you signed up for. Um, but that's the nature of that's that's what we're in. You know, if uh, if you're in that game, you have to play that game. So that's it, that's my presentation. Uh, gosh, that was uh, a bit of a long one. I do apologize um, that uh, it was quite quite long, but um, hopefully it's been, inform it's been informative, um, it's informed you, it's given you an idea of uh, this whole funding malarkey that people think is an easy ride. Hopefully it's given you some questions to ask if you do go and seek a partnership um, and some maybe some ideas of things that you can do to help you serve your clients better because we all know that there are people out there that you are desperate to help. You know, you really want to help them make a livelihood, change their career, but they just can't afford to. So, um, you know, it's, um, yeah, <laughs> it is a difficult one. Yeah. <laughs>